Greetings to everyone. Happy Hanukkah. I hope all is doing well. I'm in the uh, Beth Jacob office here, uh, so hopefully you can see me. Um, it is so nice to see everyone, and uh, hopefully your Hanukkah is going well. I wanted to share two seemingly separate ideas today uh, on the theme of silver linings. One, um, I think, less controversial, and one that actually stirred a fair amount of controversy over time. Um, that uh, again, we always talk about inspiration through halacha, and this is meant to be in the, in the vein of that notion of inspiration. So the first thing I wanted to share is actually a Dvar Torah. You will uh, see a form of this Dvar Torah if you look, Beth Jacob in the Beth Jacob email has what we call our Torah Weekly. Um, it's a link, uh, we put a new newsletter together with Shabbos, and I recommend, uh, this is a sneak preview uh, that uh, came actually from Rabbi Broner, but it's a, an idea that we're gonna share a little bit in a different light. Um, where he presents the following um, dilemma that I think is going to actually help us uh, present a, a different approach to uh, something from, uh, from the halacha and the Torah in a different place. So the dilemma he presents is the following. Um, we know that uh, in the parsha, Paro has these dreams, right? That your mind is already racing when you hear them, right? Fat cows, skinny cows, fat grain, skinny grain. You're wondering what it could mean, thinking of all types of different interpretations. Um, and similar, by the way, compare it to the dreams that Yosef had in a different context with his brothers. And what's yes. fascinating is that when they heard, the brothers heard the dreams that Yosef had about 11 this and 12 that and everybody knew exactly what it meant. There was not a whole tumult and hullabaloo over its interpretation. Yaakov says, hey, Yosef, are you implying that we will all serve you? And that indeed seems to be what he was implying um, in, in many ways as, as it ended up playing out. So here, what's fascinating is Paro has these dreams and we kind of think about these things and the dreams include the main food sources and the main gods of the Egyptians. It includes the Nile River, it includes a bunch of different things that in hindsight, Yosef's interpretation doesn't sound so crazy. Um, and yet it seems that um, the soothsayers, they have a hard time coming up with what actually what all this means. For example, um, the, <laughs> the, um, the Torah talks about, the Rashi quotes a bunch of different things that it says, um, they suggested that he would have seven daughters and his seven daughters would then be buried. That was one of the interpretations that Khartoumim had. Or he had seven kingdoms and those seven kingdoms would rebel against him. And uh, one second, he only has one kingdom. He has, uh, you know, Ahasuerus uh, with 127 uh, nation. Or th um, so somehow, it feels like none of these hit the mark. They don't resonate with him at all. Now, no interpretation is going to be proven. The only proof you need is Paro saying, ah, that hits the spot. That fits. And they tell him all these interpretations and somehow in his gut, he's like, no, no, that's it. So the butler tells him, but there's this prisoner named Yosef. And this prisoner named Yosef had this whole plan, um, had this whole knack for interpreting dreams and it worked, we should bring him. So Paro somehow clearly sees something lacking in his professionals, right? The professional soothsayers who are supposed to give him the right answer. So he decides to call a lowly prisoner sitting and rotting in jail to be able to fix it. Comes along Yosef. And Yosef tells him a seemingly, you know, uh, uh, obvious interpretation. So much so that you wondered these geniuses, these professionals, these soothsayers, could none of them have thought of what seems they had to go so far afield as that seven daughters, which power doesn't have, or seven kingdoms, which he's not currently going to war with. Like, you know, could they not have thought of interpretations that fit a little bit more with what we call the fact pattern? 
And then Yosef feels like he has to also offer advice. You know, talk about speaking out of turn to the king after he's coming out of jail. And so the suggestion, again, Rabbi Broner uh, fits it together very beautifully, but it's, a, you know, and, and it's an idea you find in a couple of different sources, which was the following, which is that there was one piece that all of the Chartumim, all of the soothsayers missed, that Yosef hit upon that made the whole picture look different. And what is that? That you can have plenty and famine in the same vision. You see, when the soothsayers see this, they're like, okay, those two things can't coexist. You can't have a world that has problems and also you know, success. It's either or. Either you're in famine and all is bad, or you're in plenty and all is good. And so they had to come up with a vision that, you know, focused either on one thing or the other. And power was like, no, something's missing. I had a dream with all of these elements. Something's got to bring them and pull them together. Yosef was the first one who said, the world is more complicated than that, right? That there is a world that has restrictions and famine and difficulty and challenge. And that same world has inspiration. And therefore it led naturally to his advice, which is you stockpile the good so you have the resources to impact the challenges, to face the challenges. You stockpile the food during the years of plenty so you can respond to the years of famine. You can have a vision that has the fat cows and the, and the skinny cows. You can have a world that balances and navigates between complicated, seemingly contradictory realities. Now, Rebrona makes the point that he says that, uh, you know, think about that in terms of our, you know, coronavirus restrictions, right? You can't eat out. Okay, so you spend time connecting home. You can't see people, uh, you know, in, in person. And that's a very tough struggle. So now you reach out over Zoom and you talk to people in different countries, right? Children can't really go to school. So there have been so much more innovation in educational technology because of that. As they say, there's a, you know, a funny joke. Again, uh, I wish a happy birthday to my mother. So I'll use this uh, mother joke which is that when, you know, when mom says you can't jump on the bed and you can't do this and you can't do that, so you invent some way to, you know, jump on the bed without her hearing. And so what, what's the, you know, the idea? They say that mothers are the necessity of invention as opposed to the uh, uh, necessity is the mother of invention. But the, the idea is that, you know, during times where we don't have the ability to connect with classic educational technologies of frontal lecture, which we'd love to do, you got to think about other ways and you weave in new multimedia possibilities, you know, um, that, that, uh, that transform the landscape. Um, you know, now you can't leave your house without PPE and a plan and where you're going and what you're doing in, in Israel, you know, during the lockdowns, how many meters are you traveling, you know, all of these things. Um, but it requires you to be a lot more planned out and thought out and, 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 you know, contemplative of every detail that you do. There are worlds that balance struggle and success. And that is the message that Yosef hit upon and Paro said, aha, that's my aha moment. Now I can see how every piece of the dream comes together. But that was something that was outside of the scope of what the Chartumim, what the soothsayers could imagine where you live in contradictory worlds that are nuanced and complicated. And that is, um, I, I think, actually a key to a totally different, uh, a totally different um, uh, uh, idea that is explained in a, uh, in a different context. And that's the context I'll show you now about what seems to be a, uh, a very, uh, you know, uh, earth shattering, Machloket, argument between, let me see if I can get it here, between 
um, Rashi, Rashi and Ramban versus the Sforno. And we'll talk a little bit about what the interpretations later um, uh, uh, scholars had to this, uh, this, um, this dispute. So just again, to recap, the point that we're making through the Parsha is this idea of contradictions aren't actually as contradictory as you may think. And that I think is a, a, a powerful idea. So let's take a look and I will share the screen here. Um, here we go. Let's see if we do this right. Screen number two. Okay, so what you're seeing here is actually a source sheet that I did not compile. It's in Hebrew. Um, it's compiled by a, a professor, a teacher named uh, Rabbi Dr. Harvey Velofsky, who uh, lives in England, is a, uh, a teacher. Um, and we're going to use some of the sources he read. Really, it was help just helpful to collate. We, he went took it in a different direction. Um, but he deals with a, he calls it a Renaissance approach to human suffering, but we'll, we'll move on, you know, because we're not going to focus on that uh, in a broad way the way he did, but his sources are very, very helpful. And he deals with the following question. We fast forward a few parshiot to the story of the exodus from Egypt and the servitude in Egypt, right? Shiabud and Yitziat Mitzrayim. And in the story of the uh, um, plagues and the hardening of power's heart and all that story, many of the Mepharshim deal with this very fundamental basic question, which is, what is the background to God hardening power's heart and where does free will fit into that? But in a broader sense, the nature of the purpose of the plagues and the you know over and over again punishment that the Egyptians uh, received. Seemingly went over again, you know, 10 different plagues. And what's the sort of the undercurrent of the story? So look a little bit at the attitude that Rashi takes. Look at Rashi, Rashi's attitude. This is in the Pasuk. Which means God says, I shall enlarge, I will have from the word rob, make many the, uh, um, you know, the plagues against Egypt, the uh, wondrous uh, nature bending uh, events that I will do against the Egyptian people, the punishments I will mete out to them. Says Rashi, Vani Akshah says Rashi, Meharshi Hirshia, Beatriz Kinegdi, Vulagalui Sheena Hakruach, Umot of Devo Dazaral, Tedlik Shal Mishum. He says, you know what? Paros crossed the line. And I'm going to harden his heart because he's just gone too far. And sometimes when you go too far, it's beyond the point of no return and of tshuva and repentance. And now all bets are off. Totally sheyit kasheli bo. It is appropriate for me, says God, according to Rashi, that his heart will be hardened. Leman har bot bo totai. So I can punish him more and more because he will not repent. And why? Betakiru, so you Jewish people will recognize it, Gvurota, will recognize his great power. This is a path that God takes. Maybe that sometimes God will bring difficulty and challenge to the nations of the world. Of David, those are all those who are idolatrous. That the Jewish people shall see and fear and hear and understand. Right? And he quotes Psukim, source of Natanach. In other words, and we talked about this a couple times ago, and we talked about the philosophy of punishment, where we suggested that punishment is either educational or serves as a message to others or even a deterrent. And what Rashi is suggesting is that the punishment against the Egyptians was meant to serve as a message to us, the Jewish people, to see, look at the kind of God who takes care of you, where things are difficult, things are tough. You go, but don't worry, as, Rash, as the, God says in the uh, in the brief pain of Tarim, I shall watch, uh, I shall exact, I, you know, I will uh, make a cheshbin, as they say in you know uh, in the Yiddish vernacular, I'll take care of those who you know uh, who afflict you. And so Rashi says God has an interest as the leader and the, the the God of the Jews 
to show the Jewish people, this is the kind of God who takes care of you. And so God sets up the situation where it's going to play out whether the Egyptians like it or not. And therefore, you know, there was not part of the plan for power to turn around and say, oh, I see the light, God. It's all right. It's all good. I, I repent. Everything's going to be fine. I totally, you know, power, you know, the, the, the storyline may have changed had power done that, but God wasn't having it. And that was because God had to show the Jewish people, Laman, Takiru Atem, you Jewish people should see Geburo Tai, my power, my might. That's Rashi's interpretation and his philosophy about the plates. Similarly, you'll see in the Ramban. The Ramban writes, Vani Akshet Lev Paro. Amr Bamidrash Rabba, I'm right here uh, in the Ramban. Gilalo Sheya Atid Lechazeket Libo Bavor Lasot Bo Hadid. God will harden Pharaoh's heart in order to make sure that power deserves a significant punishment that God can mete out against him. That's why he hardened Pharaoh's heart. La'asot bo hadin. Tachat she'evidam ba'vodakasha. Because at the end of the day, the point to which he oppressed the Jewish people has gone so far as to be unforgivable. And therefore, I'm going to harden his heart, closing that door. It's too, you've done too much, too bad to do, and, and anything you now try to repent will be too little, too late. And so I'm not even going to give you the option of letting the Jewish people go so easy because I'm going to harden your heart so you don't open that door. As it says, I hardened his heart. I made it heavy. Right? Uh, the Gemara says, one second, isn't this a, uh, um, an opening to those who want to have a uh, prosecuting argument, so to speak, against this narrative that, uh, um, uh, um, you know, the Jewish people didn't um, give power a fair fight because God hardened his heart, that God didn't give power. Amar Rabbi Shimon ben Lakish, Rabbi Shimon ben Lakish says, those heretics should have their mouth shut. Nobody. Why? Because God says, God warns you once. Fool me once, no problem. Fool me twice. After a certain point, again, it's too little, too late. So that's, again, the Ramban's approach. Similar to Rashi, he suggests that really what's going on here is that Paro loses the chance to just wipe away the past. You've, you've had warnings, you've had messages, now it's too late. And again, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the sunflower, you know, the, the, there's a lot of similar narratives when you have, um, even in recent hero, history, the stories of Simon Wiesenthal and, and, and you know, the, the Nazis who asked for forgiveness and what exactly that means and how to respond. It's, there's echoes of that in this Ramban. Okay, right? And again, uh, the Ramban says, everybody asks this question. Right? If God hardened Paro's out, what's his sin? And again, Rashi, uh, the Ramban lays out a famous iteration of his philosophy that, you know what? It's not, uh, you know, uh, self-preservation oh. is not, uh, you know, what, what allows you to... Um, you know, to somehow wipe away the past. Okay, and then the Ramban goes further. All right, um, you see this in Ramban and the Sporno uh, and the Ramban and Rashi in multiple other places, and maybe we'll go back and see them. Okay, let's take a totally different approach. All right, again, just to reiterate, we saw Rashi and the Ramban who suggest that the story of the plagues was making the Jewish people, you know, uh, uh, um, you know, the Jewish people uh, not uh, not eligible, so to speak, for, uh, sorry, the, the Egyptian people not eligible for parole or for a lightening of the sentence because of this point of, again, you've gone so far and God has a plan bigger than you, Mr. Pharaoh or King Pharaoh. Listen to Sforno. Sforno says, well, again, just if we, if we think about the, 
uh, Rashi and Ramban, just for one more moment. If you would ask a Rashi and Ramban feeling that there is any part of the cheshben, uh, any part of the whole narrative here, looking out for the Egyptians' best interests, would you think that that is part of the calculus of the story? For me, reading Rashi and Ramban, I would say no. Maybe they it could have been early on, but at this point, no. At this point, we're not thinking about the greater good of the Egyptians. Rashi said we're thinking greater good of the world who watches this, who learns the lesson of the greater good of the Jewish people who see the power of their God and the fact that they, as they say, their blood is not hefker. But one of the priorities in the story of the Makot is not to check off and make sure the Egyptians are okay. But listen to Sforno. Sforno goes on the Pasuk, uh, on Shmuel Per Gimel Pasuk Zion. Sforno says the following, Yomer Hashem, this is in, Sefer, in Parshat Shmuel. I see the affliction of my people in Egypt. I've heard their cries. For those taskmasters above them. I truly and deeply know the pain they're suffering, the, the feeling, the pain they're feeling, the suffering they're going through. Listen to the way Sporno interprets that. Pasuk. Again, if I were Rashi and the Ramban interpreting that Pasuk, it fits perfectly well. God says, you know what? You guys, you Jewish people, you're my priority now. I see and feel your pain, and therefore I'm going to go against your enemies with both barrels. I'm not going to think about their greater good. I'm going to uh, you know, unleash your beti etok tota. So this fits, you could see it fitting very well with the, the, the thesis that are presented by Rashi and Ramba. Listen to Sforno. Sforno says the following, Kloma, right? God says, I heard my pain, I heard the pain of my people in Egypt, and I hear the screams, I, I feel their pain, I know their pain. Says Sforno, Kloma, af al pi shiraiti etani ami vitrayim. Notice the words he says, af al pi. He says, even though I've seen the pain of my people, Right, like the story of the burning bush. And I shall punish their afflictors, their, their oppressors, no question about it. He says, this is saying, I hear their pain, but I will not completely destroy their oppressors. I Meaning Rashi and Ramban would read this parsha, read this pasuk as saying, you know what? I will have no mercy on those who oppress them. Sforno says, even though they're oppressing you and I'm going to have to punish them, they're not going to be completely destroyed. Think about where the shift of the messaging goes, according to Sforno. According to Sforno, it's not about how much God's going to punish the Egyptians, but it's how, how much he's not going to destroy them. Right? Again, if you think about the punishment, it's either, wow, God punished them so harshly, or, wow, God didn't go all the way and destroy them. And all he did was bring 10 plagues against them. And says the Sforno in a fascinating approach that, you know, you never think about unless, what's the symbolism of a burning bush that does not get consumed? Says the Sforno, the bush is the Egyptians. And it will burn, it will have affliction, it will have plagues. But vasne einene ukal, it shall not be consumed completely. Wow. Says, that's a, and that's the words of the Sforno, lo yasufu ha mitzrim, the mitzrim from the word sof, or you know, actually, you know, or destruction. Lo yasufu ha mitzrim, ha sarimotam, that are afflicting them, bechomako, they will not be destroyed and completely gone. Kemo shehura inyan vehasne enene ukal, like it is symbolized in the notion 
of the bush not being completely consumed. Ki omnam. For behold, eina kavana b'makot, the plan of the uh, um, of the uh, 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 the plague shavi alehem lachritam ulo shiv yisraelim komam. The plan is not to destroy the Egyptians and replace them with the Jews. Avalat seal Yisrael miyadam ulo shiyavam b'makom acher to save the Jews and get them out of there. So again. Rashi and Ramban versus Fona are describing the exact same fact pattern. But think how diametrically different the focus is of Rasforno. Sforno's focus is how much God is not doing. God is not, you know, doing the classic control, you know, uh, um, conquer, command and conquer, right? You know, um, that uh, I conquer and I get rid of, and I, you know, um, uh, you know, the classic way the world worked back then, which was I conquered a place and I took it over. The Jewish people have their God coming and conquering and afflicting the Egyptians, so they could rise above them and and be their overlords. No, God says I want to get them out of here. I hear their pain and I got to stop that. But I'm again, think about what Sir Swan was saying. I'm not interested in taking things even further against the Egyptians. How different of a view is that than Rashi, Rashi Ramban? Rashi Ramban says, no, this is all about giving the Egyptians maximum pain. Sforno agrees that that's going to happen, but it's actually about not giving them even more, not totally destroying them. And again, the focus is fascinating in its difference. Let's look at another pasuk. Um, when God is threatening to destroy the, uh, to kill the firstborn of the Egyptians, and he says, send my people and they shall serve me, and if not, I will, um, shall you, you know, if you, when you uh, refuse to send them, I'm going to kill your firstborn. Says for them, look at this. I shall destroy, I shall kill your firstborn. God generally functions with the divine path of one, a measure for measure. Like a, like a path that a person charts for himself, that shall find him. The story of the plague of the firstborn, the Vada on its own, I tell mishpat onesh leparo mikol makot. It was meant to be a punishment to Pharaoh, as you know, to uh, over and above all the rest of the plagues. Aval she'ar hamakot hayu laot ulemofet leman yashubu. Listen to the Sforno. The Sforno says, "Why does God show up at the last plague and says, if you don't do this, I'm going to kill your son?" He says this morning because this is the first of the plague, plague number 10, which is actually directed as a punishment. Every other plague was not a punishment. It was a wake-up call. It was a method of tough love. That every other plague was was a sign, a wonder, Leman Yashuvu to cause them to repent. God sincerely hoped and held out hope that the Egyptian people, if not Pharaoh himself, would see the light and turn things around. And listen to what he quotes. We say this Pasuk on Yom Kippur. He lo yachpots for God does not desire the sinner to die. Ki, and listen to this. Lo na'au bifnehem darkei hatshuva amitit klal. God did not lock the door of, um, God locked, did not lock the door of repentance whatsoever. Now think about this versus Rashi and Ramban that we started with. Like you can't get, uh, you know, so to speak, 
You know, it can't be more different in their approaches. He says, God didn't want the Egyptians to be destroyed or hurt. He never closed the door to repentance, like the Ramban and Rashi said he did. Luchachmu, had they been wise, had they had the true wisdom to truly repent and, you know, as they say, see the light and come with true tshuva, like, for example, the people of Nineveh did. Compare this to the people of Nineveh, where a message was sent to them and they turned around and repented, says the Sforno. Shehia tshuva, such a repentance, like the people of Nineveh, goes, ad kisea kabon, goes all the way to God's throne itself. Asheria matzela, that will save people. V'notenet chen v'en elokim, and gives favor in the eyes of God. Right? That, you you know, we say this in the in the Masechet Yuma, we say this when it comes to the, our high holidays and the repentance season. Avonot, your sins, na shavim lo kizkuyot can be seen as, you can turn your sins into merits. Or at least repent in your fear of punishment, which is not the greatest level, but it's something where you say, I'm afraid God can punish me, so I better go back and follow his ways. Only Right, the only parts of the story that were punishments were the very last plague and the story of uh, the, the drowning at the sea. But the very last plague, because God has to do what's called measure for measure, midah k'negev midah. Paro afflicted the firstborn of God, b'ni b'chori Yisrael. Now, the, uh, uh, the response is going to be that God is going to afflict the firstborn of Paro. So there is that midah k'negev midah. But listen to the undercurrent of the Sforno. The Sforno says all nine of the plagues were meant to educate and help the Egyptians. Let that sink in. Again, see that with the sphere, the mindset of Rashi and the Ramban, where they said, don't you dare think that that's what the plan was. And again, I think there's a line in the Ramban here. Let me see if I can find it. Um, Let's see, uh, see if I can find it here. Uh, here we go. Listen to the Ramban, right here at the top of the page. Ramban says, Ratsa HaKadosh Baruch Hu. God wanted, this is the Ramban talking, not the story. God wanted Litsa'er Otam B'makot to afflict them and pain them through plagues? Lo not to give them one iota of benefit. Lehoil means to benefit them. God says to the Ramban, was not planning at all to benefit the Egyptians vis-a-vis -vis this plague process. God wanted to afflict them because of all the stuff we talked about, the punishment, the Jewish people seeing that there's, uh, you know, a justice in the world, etc. But that's the Ramban says the job of the plagues is not to give any benefit to the Egyptians. What does the Sforno say? The Sforno says nine of the ten plagues were exactly for that purpose. To give benefit to the Egyptians, to hopefully give them that tough love, that wake-up call, that God doesn't want to have to take things further. But hey, you know what? If you don't, uh, if you don't uh, you know, uh, see the light, bad stuff's going to happen. Um, so this is a, you know, a really fascinating look. Um, uh, uh, let's just see if we can find one more example. Um, um, here we go. Uh, Bani, again, the story of hardening Paro's heart. Bani Akshet et Lev Paro. I shall harden Paro's heart. Behir Beiti et Ototai and I shall... I uh, have, that's the same puzzle that we saw before with Rashi and the Rampa. And um, it says, Paro, but Paro, I know he ain't going to listen. 
And I'm going to put my hand against the, the Egyptians and I'm going to take my uh, multitudes of the Jewish people out of Egypt. It was great wonders. It says Sforno, remember what Rashi and Ramban said about that Pasuk? That God is going again, both barrels against the Egyptians. Listen to Sforno's approach. Based on that which we know that God is a forgiving God, who does not desire the destruction of the evildoers, but rather that they return and that they change their ways. As it says, I want the evildoer to return from his path and he should live. I better give him a bunch of wake-up calls, says God, with a tremendous number of miracles. So that the Egyptians truly repent. To show that the power and the uh, chesed that God's doing to the Jews with his these great wonders. I need to show my power, says God. Um, and of course, there's a value that the Jewish people shall see. You should tell the story. And there's no doubt that had it not been hardening the Paro's heart, we shall believe Says the Sforno, why did God harden Paro's heart? Because what he truly, what he really did was he inured Paro to the pain. He made Paro not feel the pain. And if Paro couldn't feel the pain, then he, if he truly repented, he'd be repenting honestly. As opposed to if his heart wasn't hardened, he might just have been, you know, saying whatever God needs to get him off my back. But that wouldn't have been a true repentance. So says the Sforno, the purpose of the hardening of Paro's heart was not to stop repentance, but to make it more genuine. And again, he said um, that I don't want your your punishment, your, your repentance to be outside of your built-y a holy bowl. I'm based on the notion that you just simply can't handle it. Ode Sarata Makota pain of doing. So I'm gonna give you these wake-up calls but I'm going to keep within you the capability of thinking rationally. I'm going to harden your heart, meaning I'm going to stop that reflex that just says, let me think whatever to say to get this guy off of me. I am going to make it such that when you are able to objectively think about what the message of these plagues are, you'll get the message. And then when you repent, it'll be true. Now, power didn't. But that's how he interprets the hardening of Paro's heart. A wild, you know, uh, uh, intense interpretation. Um, and listen to what he says. If Paro truly desired to go and, and uh, repent, to, to uh, subjugate himself to God or re return to him with true tshuva, there was nothing stopping Paro from truly repenting. There would have been nothing standing in his way. So when God says, I'm hardening Paro's heart, that he should be able to handle the plagues and won't send the Jewish people just out of a reflex of getting them away so the pain will stop. Um, rather what I want, I want to give them my wonders. So through the wonders, wow, this is such a powerful God. They should see the greatness of God and then they should return with true truth. Um, and listen to this, and this is the most powerful one. Remember what the Pasuk said, Lamantis saper, so you shall tell your children about the, the, uh, the, um, 
uh, the, pla the, the, the plagues that God did to the Egyptians. Whenever I read that, I said, you should tell, the Jewish people should tell their children about the story of the exit of Egypt, right? We have Pesach that does that. Listen to what the Sporto says. The goal was that the story of the Egyptians' uh, plagues and the Exodus should be a story of people who get a wake up call and then do an introspection and return to God. The story of the plagues was meant to be a story about repentance. Unfortunately, it didn't play out that way, but that was the goal of the story, says the Sforno. Um, and that's the message that the story was meant to be told in the, in the, uh, in the uh, ears of all the generations. Now, again, let's, uh, let, let's, let's say one more time how diametrically opposed these approaches are. You know, the Sforno is literally almost living on a different planet, reading the exact same psukim of Rashi and the Ramban. And um, you just look at one interesting other source um, where he talks about, uh, uh, you know, for example, the concept of the chosen nation, right? The Torah says uh, later, Right, if you listen to the covenant of God and you follow the Torah, you're going to be this thing called Am Segula. Right, again, translated different ways, often in vernacular translated as the chosen people. It says the Sforno, Don't forget that every single member of the human race is, unto, you know, incredibly precious to me. And the human race is, you know, uh, uh, you know, beloved and lofty to me. That you are within the chosenness of all of humanity. He doesn't say oh, you're a chosen people. You say that humanity is chosen and you have a unique niche within that. But he immediately, he, he can't let this pasuk go by without highlighting the universal notion of the Tzalem Elohim, the uniqueness and the greatness of all of humankind. I would say Rashi and Ramban, if I was them, would approach this and say, no, this is talking about the uniqueness and the greatness of the Jewish people. The, the uh, Sforma says, no, no, you got to give it a bigger and a broader context. And I think what's going on here is an interesting example. Now, the theory suggested by Rabbi Dr. Bolovsky is a totally, is a fascinating theory, which is that he looked into the history of Rashi and the Ramban and Rashi versus the Sporn. When did Rashi and the Ramban live? They lived in the age of pogroms and disputations and uh, inquis you know, obviously not the Spanish Inquisition, you know, but, but um, and incredible per persecution, right? There's a book uh, that the Ramban wrote called his uh, Disputation. Vikua Haramban with Pablo Cristiani, where you know they it was at the height of this uh, um, existential persecution that the Jewish people were under, where they were under all every generation after generation under all sorts of terrible threats. And so uh, the, the the approach he says is, and that led them to interpret the stories in the Torah the way they did. When they're living in a world where the, so to speak, the goyim are against us. So when you see a story about God punishing the Egyptians, you use that lens to say, of course, that's what's going on. Look at his life. So when he sees God meeting out the punishment of 10 plagues against the Egyptians, of course, he's going to say, lo leho illahem klau. He has no mercy, no sympathy for the people who are currently in his own day and age oppressing him. So when he reads the, the Torah, reads the Parsha, he's of course going to say, no, 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 this is God going against our enemies with both barrels because it was an in, inspiring and an appropriate, you know, and a powerful view for him in his life. Same for Rashi. 
right? You had crusades and pogroms. Sforn, on the other hand, had a very different experience. He was as close as possible to be a member of the royal court. He was a, uh, a physician who had his training paid for as part of a public university. He um, was a, uh, you know, it lived in, in, in an Italian world, which was much more open-minded and cosmopolitan in many ways. Not that there wasn't anti-Semitism. So the approach that, that uh, you know, again, he calls it the Renaissance approach but, uh, that this uh, Dr. Malofsky suggests is that Sforno had a softer spot for the nations of the world around him because they weren't as aggressive at his time and day. Um, and therefore, when he interprets the story and the, pus the, the verses in the Torah, he approaches it with a much softer brush. And he suggests that really what's going on is that God really wanted to, the, to, to make sure the Egyptians would end up okay. And this was an educational exercise to bring them along and to wake them up, to bring them to true understanding and repentance. Again, a very different approach. So again, that, that's his, uh, you know, the approach. I would perhaps argue that it's, um, you need to, you know, it's, I, it may border on the disingenuous to say that Rashi interpreted this pasuk because he had a hard time with the guy. I would, you know, uh, um, obviously everybody looks at life through the prism of their own experience, but I would suggest that Rashi and uh, Ramban, um, you know, were interpreting the Torah based on their overarching philosophy. And again, we don't have time now, but we're getting to the end. But um, we have lots of different sources where both Sforno has things talking about God's great punishment against the, the Goyim, and, um, and Rashi and Ramban will find other sources that, you know, have a much more nuanced approach. Um, so you can take that, you know, or, you know, take that approach. But what I actually think that we can present here is an example of the Dvar Torah, the idea with which we started which is you can have the same pasuk. You can have diametrically opposed viewpoints within that pasuk, right? Shivim panim la Torah means that we can see the world in the way that the soothsayers of Paro couldn't see it. Where you see something and you look at it and you can have a million different ways of interpreting and living within that same Torah. And the concept of machloket, of, uh, you know, of, of the back and forth that exists as a hallmark of Jewish study and something about which we are proud because we know we can all live together in that world of multiple voices. What was the problem with the soothsayers is they say you can't have a world that has a Rashi and a Sporno in the same way. Right? You can't have a world that has, you can't have a dream that has scat, fat cows and skinny cows. You can't have a world where you have a holistic picture that takes different approaches and all of them can have a connection to truth. Such a world can't exist. And Paro's like, that doesn't fit with my dream. My dream seems to have a world that doesn't fit with the story you're telling. Let me call this, uh, this uh, servant from jail who says, I'm going to teach you something that none of your soothsayers have thought of, which is that, yes, they can. Yes, you can have multiple voices and voices that diverge and contradict, and they live in that same world. And that I would say, you know, the inspiration through here interpretation, not just the halacha, is meant to guide us in that path, that there's lots of different worlds, whether it's the challenges of COVID and the opportunities those challenges represent. Or the approach of one mafarish and the same psukim being approached differently by another mafarish. I think that that notion of the harmony of the contradictory world is a very, very powerful and important message. And um, I would say that that sense of harmony, even in places and worlds that seem to contradict, is something that should be a, a powerful message that we uh, that we take and uh, understand and learn uh, throughout uh, throughout our lives and throughout. The last bit of Hanukkah. We wish everybody a uh, Hanukkah Sameach, a Shabbat Shalom.